Greetings Valley Explorers. Today we're going to start off with an introductory video that will serve as kind of like a dual purpose video for both learning how to play the amazing uh, game Earthborn Rangers from Earthborn Studios and learn how to access that demo within Tabletop Simulator. So to begin, obviously the first step would be to uh, launch Tabletop Simulator, download the Earthborn Rangers demo, which is uh, available through the, the website uh, for Steam, and then launch the program. Once you've launched it, you should see something similar to this, which will show you a starting splash screen to get you familiar with your basic choices in the game. In Tabletop Simulator, if you ever want to view something up close, you can use the mouse wheel, of course, to spin in, or you can just press the Alt button and this will zoom you in to the thing you're hovering over, in this case, the splash screen. And today what we're going to do is play the prologue to get kind of like familiar with the basics of the game. So first thing, of course, we're going to want to do is press the dismiss button. Now, we, what we see here is the simulated table top, which will have the play area. And the first thing you're going to want to do is highlight over to the bar that helps you uh, pick a color. In this case we'll pick pink and this puts us at a uh, directly uh, into a seat. And if we hit space we can readjust our camera to the default and then we can look through the rulebook to get familiar with any of the rules that we may have questions about including a uh, introductory story. And the other thing we can do is read the demo which will tell us literally how to start the game and it includes introductory text. Uh, before we begin that though, I do want to show some handy tips that are usable specifically in Tabletop Simulator. They're gonna make our life just a little bit easier. So I'm gonna zoom in on the game board and what we can start doing is adding pins or uh, which are accessible through point. So uh, you can either hit F10 or click on the point, and what it'll let us do is put little snap to points that'll make the game easier to kind of maneuver. Uh, the first thing we can do, for example, we'll go back to grab real quick, uh, which will let us move some decks out of place real quick, will be to set up the pins that we're gonna wanna use. So one handy pin, of course, would be the location. Another handy pin will be the challenge deck, put two here. Then another one will be the path deck. Put some here. Weathers can be pretty handy to pop in on. Uh, another one will be the ranger deck itself. You can put pins on the player card area, uh, but I will, uh, I probably won't do that, but you can do that. You can also uh, pin down the roll card there will be some future pins I think I'll put in, in just uh, after we get started, but I'll wait for that. So what you can see with the pins is they allow easy snap for the challenge deck. See the uh, preview for where it'll highlight after you pick it up. It makes it nice and easy to snap to. So with that in mind, um, we are going to start interacting with the game board and get the game set up. What Tabletop Simulator allows you to easily do is copy and paste. I'm going to copy the game rulebook. And I'm going to paste it uh, near where I am at. First, however, you can hit L to lock and unlock. As you can see, you can put uh, different copies of different things places. And then we'll read the introduction. Imagine a low fire burning in the pre-dawn light. Imagine you're wrapped in a warm cloak, breathing cold mountain air. You smell the smoke from the fire and the rich scent of pine. Last night you swore your oaths to the ancestors, to the elders, and to the spirit of the valley. The sun begins to rise on your first day as a ranger, a caretaker of the land, and a friend to its people. You watch as Elder Thrush retrieves her condenser kettle from a low branch, checks the water level, and then places it into the fire. As the water rises to boil, Calypsa, the ranger who mentored you for these past nine months, sets about crushing dried marrow leaf tea in plain carbon forged cups. Once it's ready, she hands you a cup. Steam pours off it. It smells of the forest. Calypsa raises her cup to 
yourself. She drinks, and you follow suit. The tea invigorates you, warmth spreading throughout your body. It feels amazing. Your eyes are drawn to the flame as you watch, your eyes unfocus. You hear the voices of your ancestors. You feel them with you. You can feel their support and their love. You hear them speak, and they remind you of the best qualities, the person you truly are. Who are you? So that's what we are going to run through. We are going to basically play the prologue, setting up a character, and in doing so, learn how to also uh, use the demo uh, through Tabletop Simulator. And the game basically lays out the different components at this part, at this point, and you can kind of see how uh, the basics of what we're doing now play out by reading the demo guide. So the first thing we're going to do is gather the aspect cards, which in Tabletop Simulator you can place by pushing the, pushing the place button, and you'll see a grid of different aspect choices. Going back to the demo, it states that uh, they each have one through three, and the way the uh, default aspects start off is one will be a one, one will be a three, and two will be a two. There is fitness, spirit, awareness, and focus, with fitness being the athletic, spirit being the ability to connect, awareness being the ability to see, and focus being the ability to think and recall things. In solo, we won't have to choose a lead ranger, because we'll just be the lead ranger. Note that this is uh, designed for a solo game, so I will take their point three concern uh, as a guide, and that fitness shouldn't be lower than two. Uh, so it shouldn't be our one spot. And indeed, I think when I think about what kind of ranger I am, I think this is an athletic person. A person who was always very physical, always active, always kind of the, the first person to climb the tree, the first person to scale the mountain, the first person to want to jump in the lake and swim to the other side and beat everyone else to the other side. So I think I'm going to want to look directly at the threes in this case. And the three three options are to have the one in awareness, the one in focus, or the one in spirit. And I think this person was probably weakest in focus in that they liked to run and get to places fast, but they didn't always know what they were looking at, and they were average when it came to observation and connection. So you can do a copy-paste on the aspect cards, and the player mat tells you where to put your aspect, which is where we will copy and paste it. Then we can hit recall on the aspect cards. From there, I will lock down my aspect card to make it easier to interact with. So now that it is locked down, I cannot select it, since it doesn't need to move mid-game at all. So going through the bullet points, we've picked our aspects. And so then we're going to look at the personality cards and separate them by their different attachments. And the personality cards will help us shape our deck right off the bat. And in the tabletop simulator, it's simply a matter of going one over to the right, uh, sorry, uh, three over to the right and going to personalities. And if we go back to the description, it tells us that the uh, that these are how we will deal with uh, approaching things that we encounter, and hence they've got approach icons. And with this, we get to pick cards that will reflect what we want our ranger to be like and how we want our ranger to start approaching issues. And so we can start with the awareness cards, as the demo uh, instructs, and we can start looking at the cards, picking which ones we want, and then we will pick one of them and pick uh, and get both versions of them. And we have to pay attention to the requirements, if there are any, because as we'll learn, as we see going through these awareness cards, they have minimum requirements. In this case, to be thorough, you have to have a two awareness. And based on the kind of way I'm envisioning this person to be as a ranger, I kind of like the idea of them being perceptive, so I will copy the perceptive card and make two copies. And then starting with the last player, which is only one, we'll go ahead and do the same for fitness, focus, and then spirit. So if we look over at the fitness cards, we can see uh, four different personality types, and I think the character is bold. Um, I think that's a pretty clear um, pick for me, so I'll get two bold. 
for astute, um, obviously they cannot be very, uh, sorry, for awareness, they cannot be astute because they don't have enough focus for it. Instead, I think I'm going to pick inventive. I think they feel like an inventive person to me who isn't always going to be paying attention to their lessons, but when they encounter new things, they struggle to invent new ways to overcome it. And then there's compassionate, engaging, persuasive, and thoughtful. I think I'm going to go with compassionate, requiring two spirit, which is a requirement we meet. And then from there, you can clean up in Tabletop Simulator by just hitting the recall button. So from there, we return to the demo guide, which then requires us to shuffle our personality cards and to place them in front of us as our deck for now. And then we will be building our deck through the rest of the gameplay, but for now, this is how we will start. So first, we pick up the card, and then in Tabletop Simulator, it is simply a matter of left-clicking. To take a deck that's face up to face down, you hit the F button. You can then shake the cards to make them shuffle, or you can hit R to shuffle. And because we did the pins earlier, it's an easy snap to, so they just slap into place, and you don't really have to worry about it. The next step is to find the Ancestor Grove, the Boulder Field, and the Lone Tree Station cards. These are location cards that I put out of play. And if we grab a deck, and if you hold it, you'll pick up the whole deck. But if you just lightly tap and pull, you can start pulling cards out of the deck. And because the location cards are all in one deck and they're not really uh, effectively a deck, I'm pulling them out so we can get at the three locations we need. The first one is Ancestor Grove. The next one is Lone Tree Station. And then finally, we're going to need the Boulder Field. So these are the three we need. The rest we don't need. And in order to kind of get this mess under control, you can just drag and drop and hit G to gather to wherever your mouse is. So now the locations are back in a comfortable uh, pile. The next thing we're going to need to do is, oh, I skipped a step, step eight, to do the energy tokens, which will match the total number of icon, or the total number that you see on your aspect card. In this case, we have three, so I'll pull out one token and I'll just copy place for three. Then we have two awareness. Then we have one focus, because we're not very uh, good at remembering our lessons. And then we have to spirit because we're average on connecting with uh, beings and this is where points can be very creating a fixed snap to point can be very useful you can create a snap to point on every number which will allow easy energy manipulation as we'll see so again to make uh, to pick up a pile of more than one thing in tabletop simulator hold the left click and you'll pick up more than one because, of course, if you just grab, you'll just grab the top one. So now we have our, ener our aspect card with our energy levels properly placed. We've begun setting up the locations. So it says to then place the Ancestor Grove into place so it's easy accessible to all players. And Boulder Field and Lone Tree Station will be used later. So that was uh, Ancestor Grove. And it says, find the woods path card set. Shuffle these cards and place them face down besides the Ancestor Grove. This is the path deck. And it's kind of the deck where things that you want and things you don't want are located. And it really, think of the path deck as the deck that fuels the environment and the rest of the, the, rest of the valley, really, besides yourself or besides your fellow players. And so we can go ahead and do that. And there's a simple way to really manage the path decks in Tabletop Simulator, and I think that's copy and paste. So rather than pick up the entire terrain set and shuffle it, losing access to a base copy, I think just copying and pasting really makes it very useful. So just copy paste, you can flip it over, it R a couple times for good luck, and you've got a shuffled path deck. Of course, in person you're going to have to actually pick up the deck, but in Tabletop Simulator we have these uh, fun little cheats. And then we have to set up the weather card. And the weather card in the tabletop simulator can be a bit deceptive because it may look like you only have one weather card. And if you flip it over, you'll see something about gathering storms. And that's how you know you've got the two cards put together because there's really two weather cards in this uh, set or the uh, demo. And you'll note that it has 
uh, three clouds as a counter to simulate the clouds. You can just take the all-purpose to all tokens, copy and paste two of them, and suddenly you've got a stack of clear uh, sky clouded, clouded stack of clouds covering up the uh, perfect day. Threatening, of course, to dissipate, as we'll discover. And then you take the common test card, which every playset has right there. I like to just lock it down just to get it out of the way so I can't interact with it, but if you want to look at it, you can press Alt and highlight and zoom in on it. And this tells you your basic tests you can do no matter what your cards are. Traverse, connect, remember, and avoid. And as we'll see, traverse in particular is the essential test of this game. So going into step 13, we're at the arrival step and we should follow the back of the Ancestor's Grove. So we'll go ahead and do that. The back of the Ancestor's Grove, it says, read point 15 and do the arrival setup. So we are going to do the arrival setup and you can read point 15 when you're doing a normal campaign play. And it says to search the path deck for the next card with presence three and discard it. So obviously in a physical game, you just Pick cards off the top of the deck, very easy to do. In Tabletop Simulator, searching can be a bit difficult. And you can do search by either picking the top cards of the deck or right-clicking right on a deck, bringing up the submenu, clicking on search, and then you'll see a list of cards that goes from left to right in terms of order. And if you want to check it, you'll see that the Prowling Wolfhound should be our first card. And if you pull off the first one, it is the Wolfhound. Just to double check in case you're not sure of yourself. So you hit search. And we're looking for presence three. And in this deck, there's only going to be the one. And that is something called a caustic mulcher. Definitely something we don't want to encounter right off the way. And in this game, whenever you search, as the rule state, you shuffle it up. And then it says, uh, search the path deck the lead ranger. We'll search the path deck for the next prey and put it into play. So we will search. Again, next meaning the first in line. The first card is Sunbury Brambles, a flora food, definitely not a prey, something in fact the prey will probably want. The first card is a Sitka Buck. And since we searched, we shuffle. So note that we've done two different setups. Uh, we did the first thing that is just done, period, which is removing a presence of three or higher from the path deck and discarding it, putting it in the discard pile. The next was to pull out a prey. And when we pull out a card, we look at its uh, upper left hand corner to see where it deploys or where it starts at, and it starts down. In other words, it starts within reach, a very important concept, which we'll deal with in just a second. But more story. Your eyes refocus, and Calypso smiles warmly. It is time, she says. As of this morning, you are no I am no longer your mentor. Like you, I am a ranger. She speaks briefly with Elder Thrush, douses the fire, and then turns to you. We will travel from here to Boulder Field. I'll stay back and follow your lead. So your goal, our goals of this round is to travel from the grove to the Boulder Field. And if we're unable to do so, they're telling us that's okay. We'll just learn more about the game as we play. So we are performing a common test this turn to do the Trevor to do a traverse test. So traversing, what we're doing is trying to make it over terrain. We're dealing with terrain when you traverse, not beings. And so what we're trying to do is put progress, which is what that kind of mountainy tent thing looks like, or that's the icon, that's what it means. And we're trying to get enough that we can travel from Ancestor Grove uh, to another location, which, as we'll see, is a bit open in this game, but for the demo, we're traveling to one place. And once there's enough, we can leave. And since we're playing with fewer cards than the deck normally has, it's possible for us to run out, suffer fatigue, uh, when we're suffering from fatigue. And when that happens, we will uh, deal with it. And uh, in the meantime, though, we will uh, try to make it to the uh, location. So if we look at Ancestor Grove, we can see game text, including the purple one and the blue for R. The purple one is the presence of the location, which can come up in various tests. The other is a uh, the amount of 
progress that's needed to travel out of this location. And I do want to put a uh, shout out to the uh, artists uh, of this game. These cards look beautiful. I can't wait to see them in person. Uh, you can also see other aspects uh, of this card. The gameplay important part of this card is going to be the yellow sun, which is part of challenge tests, which we'll see in just a second, in that it helps you um, choose a card from your discard pile and put it on top of your fatigue stack, which probably won't be a concern yet, but it might. So what we will also do is shuffle the challenge deck, which we hadn't done yet. It's an important thing to make sure you do. Shuffle a couple extra times for luck. And we are now ready to begin. So we are going to draw up to our hand, our hand size, and begin playing, which in this game is six. So we're going to play one round as described on page 12 of the rulebook. And you can scroll through or you can in this game uh, in this um tabletop simulator you to get through the rule book you rule books you can like click on the upper left hand corner where it says the pop out screen and then you can navigate manually through the rule book and s what we've done is basically already done game set up following the demo with the uh, tabletop simulator kind of getting things started note that our hand size is six and then if we go to step 12, we see the phases. One is path cards, two is ranger turns, three is travel, four is refresh. And right now we are going to do the path card step. So uh, if you click on the tabletop simulator game field out of the book, you can then maneuver the screen while keeping the rule book open. So we'll draw the top of the card, drop card of the path deck and it is another Sitka Buck. So now we've got two Sitka Bucks engaged with us, which, as you note from the yellow, they could end up uh, having a contest of uh, terrain to see who's the champion, to see who's the, who's the uh, lead buck for the region. And now that we're done with phase one, where every ranger will pull a uh, card from the path deck, now we're gonna do ranger phase two, ranger turns. And now we are going to perform tests. So the test we're most interested in is traverse, but note there is connect, remember, and avoid. So for connect, we're looking at a one, which is what connect X is, is if you look at the bottom of the common test, it says X equals the presence of the card with which you're interacting. And if we want to connect with Sitka Buck, we're looking to put five advancement tokens on it, and then it goes away. So we kind of picked the two most difficult uh, prey to get rid of. And if we look at our hand, though, we see that we have two hearts. And if we look at our energy, we do have two spirit. So in solo, the way this game works is you just take turns until you're done, and then the round ends. In multiplayer, you'll pass back and forth. That is not something you have to worry about in solo, even if it means you have to handle everything yourself. So I think what I am going to try to do is looking at the icons I have, I th think the smart play is to get rid of one of the Sitka Bucks trying a big giant presence attack or uh, uh, presence interaction. Sorry about that. Not exactly attacking to try to connect with them, to basically walk up and my very energetic, engaged ranger is going to shoo them off in a very gentle and kind way. And the way to do that would be to announce that you're performing a test, choose any amount of spirit you'd like. In this case, I'm going to put, I'm going to go all in, pick two, and in fact, I'm going to go so all in that I'm going to commit two cards to the test. And what these cards do is contribute their icons to the test. So I've got a total effort of two plus two plus two against a one. So I have to at least meet a one. And if I at least overcome the one, I apply the resulting effort, which it looks like I'm going to apply six, which is great. You'd think I would uh, succeed, but we have one wrinkle. And for anyone who's played Arkham Horror the Living Card Game, you kind of probably know what's going to happen, and that is we pick a challenge card off the top of the deck, and we apply its modifier. So the first card we pull in the challenge deck is this card right here, which has plus one spirit. So not only do I have a six, I have a seven. I've absolutely connected with this being. 
and then we now have to go through the order of operations for the tests to see what that result is. The rule book itself tells you how to perform a test and tells you uh, more about how to handle the rest of the turn. And we're going to look really quick at the tests. Uh, so first we've chosen the test, then we are committing effort, which is both energy and icons. In this case, we were doing connection and then any effort from any other sources, which once we get our full deck, that can be a gigantic amount of cards. Then we apply the modifier card, and then we're determining success or failure. We did succeed, so now we're going to resolve challenge effects. Note that since we succeeded, we're putting X onto a being, which equals effort. Our total effort was 7, so we're going to go ahead and put 7 progress counters, which like that. And if you check success or failure, you'll see that uh, 5 is going to clear it, 6 and 7 more than clear it. So the buck is cleared. And then we're just going to uh, take this giant stack and hit delete to get rid of it. Be careful with delete because you could accident accidentally delete the cards you want. And we've now put it in the uh, discard pile. And now we're going to resolve challenge effects. So we turn to the card, we see a blue icon. And it's going to be a series of icons we follow through. First says uh, if this test added uh, challenge icons, add an extra one. Oh, I cleared the card too fast. Sorry about that. I knew I got ahead of myself. The progress was placed, but we hadn't checked yet for clearing. Since this is a blue trigger, the mountain symbol, it says add an extra one. So not only seven, now we have eight. I connected the heck out of this uh, Sitka buck. Then we go from weather to location. The location has a yellow, which we did not pull. To mission, there's no missions that are active. In fact, I'll just put these missions off to the side so they're not confusing. Then we do cards along the way, which are cards up here. Then we do cards within reach which would be the Sitka Buck, which if there's an active predator, they would attack the buck. That's not going to happen, but the buck, of course, would attack back because the world is still a living environment even as we're playing through it. And then finally, cards in the play area, which we don't have. So these go into the discard pile. So now that we've connected and resolved, now we're going to clear cards, which is checking progress or harm. And to see what happens, in this case, we have so much progress that we are going to clear the buck. Sorry about the misinformation earlier, the buck is cleared now. And that's basically the gameplay. And if you look at the Ancestor Grove, it's got a threshold of one, which means we're going to want to put enough effort that we can guarantee a success. And we're going to do a little bit of a risky play here. So if we look at our hand, we have a lot of travel icons thanks to this, be, this person, this ranger, this newly created ranger being a very energetic and aggressive person. So we are going to put all of our effort into traversing. So we're going to do the fitness plus um, exploration icons, and we are going to just be bold about it, and we are going to be perceptive about it. And what this will allow us to do is do a test like we just did and put icon, or put uh, progress on Ancestors Grove. So we've chosen the test, we've committed the effort. There is one other step now we're going to do, which is I'm doing it this way instead of a different way, and that is fatigue. And so fatigue is something that happens when you interact beyond where you are. So if you are in doing something within reach, you don't suffer fatigue from something else within reach, which is why you can connect with all of the predators and preys and whatnot with uh, being other beings within reach, or you can traverse to uh, obstacles and what have you within reach. But if you go to along the way, then things within reach will fatigue you. And if you go into uh, the surroundings where the location is, then everything both within reach and along the way fatigues you. So in this case, we are going to get fatigued. And fatigue is the presence amount. So we take one card and we put it face down into the uh, fatigue stack. 
And the fatigue, fatigue stack in this game is a pretty intriguing method. It's a really cool way to both get cards but also burn down your health. So I've got one card left to be fatigued from, so I've, uh, the pressure's really on to finish this traverse test. So going back to the test, I have total effort of three, plus four, five, plus six, to try to get to four. So we'll pull the top card of the challenge deck, and boom. So we have zero. So our total effort is six. So we can um, either take the progress counters or take the progress dice. And you can just hit the number you want it to spin to, and boom. We've got now six effort on the Ancestor Grove. But now we have to do the resolve challenge step, which is the sun. So a perfect day doesn't have a sun, but, oops, sorry about that. The Ancestor Grove does. And so now we're going to take the top card of the Ranger discard and place it on top of your fatigue stack. So I've got um, two of these. Oh, wait a minute. I think uh, cards go in a discard before that. So we'll put bold up. And we put it on top of the fatigue stack. Now we've done the entirety of the challenge. Uh, there is, sorry, uh, of course, to check the prey. But since the other buck is gone, they're not going to gore each other to determine the dominant buck of the terrain or of the area. So now we have finished. We can um, look at clearing cards. And we note that locations are cleared separately. And we're not going to clear them until we go to the travel phase. So we're not going to do anything else so we can jump right to the travel phase. Normally you might do other things, but with just this basic deck, that's all we're going to do. So we have now a travel option available to us, and we're ready to go. And we are ready to stop our turn. It says, do not move on the refresh phase. We're going to continue to build your ranger deck before we move to the next round. If you successfully travel to Boulder Field, shuffle all the woods cards into the path deck and follow the setup instructions for Boulder Field. Then, whether you're at Boulder Field or Ancestor Grove, proceed to the next round. One final thing we're going to do before we close out this introductory demo, I'm going to put some pins on this map because I think that's a pretty handy way of tracking yourself. And you'll note the demo is actually pretty expansive. You get a lot of really fun places to go to and a lot of interesting people to run into. And what I like to do is I like to take one of the ranger tokens we're playing with and just put it right on the map where it happens to fit perfectly. So what we're going to be doing is going from Ancestor Grove to Boulder Field. And we're going to then pick up the deck. And we're going to follow the instructions as it says, which is... Continue to build the ranger deck. If you're successful, travel to Boulder. Reshuffle all the woods cards into the path deck and follow the setup instructions for Boulder Field. So we can clear off the progress tokens. We can pull this back up. And now we're going to put Boulder Field into play. And because we traveled along a forest route between Ancestor Grove and Boulder Field, we're going to use the woods again. We're going to continue our journey and clean up the board a little bit and make sure we follow the proper steps to finish the round. The one thing would be to, uh, one thing we need to do is shuffle the Sitka Buck into the pile. That's supposed to have 12 path cards, we only had 11 there. And then we continue on with the travel step, which we kind of jumped ahead on and did. But going to the rule book, after we do travel, which includes arrival, so we'll go ahead and do that. Um, and arrival includes following uh, the steps that we've already begun. We make sure to shuffle the new path deck and look at what Boulder Field requires, which is to draw the top challenge card and do what it says. So the challenge deck is here, draw the top card, and the symbol is the sun, so we scout to then draw one path card. And in this game, scouting means something very specific. It's kind of like a keyword, much like search. With search, you look for a specific card from top, starting from the top of the deck going to the bottom. With scout, though, you look at the number of cards it tells you to from whatever deck it tells you. So in this case, uh, the top two cards of the path deck. We look at two of them. There is a uh, wolfhound and an overgrown thicket. And then with scouting, 
you can either put the cards on the top or the bottom of the deck. In this case, I think I'll go ahead and keep the Thicket on top and put the Prowling Wolfhound on the bottom. So I'll pick up the deck and drop it down underneath the so the Wolfhound is underneath it, and then put it back where it was. And unlike searching, scouting just requires uh, you to put it back where you found it. So in some ways, scouting lets you especially depending on the deck and the size of the deck you're going to scout, really set up certain turns. So in this case, Boulder uh, Field has been set up. Then we can uh, flip it over, and we can note that there is game text on front that's going to affect how we play the game, of course. Uh, not just the presence value, but also the requirement for moving out of here, the, the amount of progress we need. So the overgrown thicket, of course, as we explored la or we discovered last time, goes into the along the way zone. So that's where we've put it. And now we've completed our travel, uh, the travel steps that we should do, um, finishing up with the arrival set, the arrival setup. And now we're doing the refresh. Note that when we traveled, the uh, stuff that was when uh, within reach actually didn't follow us and we were able to get rid of it. So sometimes you can kind of like run away from your problems in this game if you need to. So first we uh, draw a ranger card, but this game is telling us not to because we're going to do some steps before then. But we'll, refinish, we'll refresh our energy pool and then follow the demo steps. So the demo step we had stopped in the middle of was 14 where it says uh, at the end of your turn, stop, do not move on to the refresh phase. We're going to continue to build your ranger deck and uh, do that before continuing. So after we successfully traveled, shuffle the woods as we've done. Then we're at the Bartle Boulder Field or the Ancestor Grove, in our case, Boulder Field. We're going to read the following text. As you walk beneath the shade of a long-limbed long -limbed oak, you think back to your youth living and playing in the villages and wild spaces of the valley, valley. A light breeze cools your skin, and it conjures a memory of your apprenticeship. You had finished your first day's work, sweat cooling on your skin, overlooking the silver fin, its waters sparkling with colors of sunset. You stood at a moment of promise. Now, as a newly sworn ranger, you stand at another, buoyed by the lessons learned in your youth. And it goes on to say that now that we've gotten a sense for the game, we kind of are thinking back to our background, to some memories we had about what it was like before we even started the Ranger Path. And that's point 15 to find each of the four background cards and in Tabletop Simulator, it'll be part of the uh, recall zone that they set up. So we can go at this point to the backgrounds, hit place. So rather than be a stack of four, it's going to be four rows that will include the four backgrounds. And the four backgrounds are Artisan, Forager, Shepherd, and Traveler. So I don't quite see the character as being an artisan who worked on stuff. I don't quite see them having the patience to work with plants, which is what a Forager would do, or with animals like a Shepherd would do. I see them as kind of more of a Traveler, a person uh, that just, you know, had to just take steps, had to just walk out into the wild and see what they could find. Um, and I'll go ahead and grab Eagle Eye to start us off. And note, of course, that the uh, background cards, as with the personality cards, do have minimum attributes uh, requirements. In this case, uh, one, which I do meet. There's also two for Paths Reformed. Strider, I'll go ahead and take that. Um, and you'll note that each of the four Backgrounds does have some kind of a pattern for number of cards and requirements for cards. So the Traveler does have three total focus cards to pick from, one of which I can't. I cannot take the Adaptable Multi-Tool, even though it's a really good card. Um, I'll take the Ironwood Boots. So that puts me at six. And we're supposed to have five individual cards for a total of ten in our deck. I'll take the trail mix help out with fatigue and I'll go ahead and take the reverb locket that can be fun so now we've got 10 cards for our deck and we'll take them over to our pile 
and then going on, uh, basically we jumped into point 16 already because we're just doing a solo team, uh, solo build, not a team build. So we don't quite have to worry about other people's uh, needs. And it says uh, to check the aspect values, which you've done. And then we're going to point 17 where we're supposed to take our hand, the deck, the discard, but not the fatigue uh, stack, and then just kind of shuffle them together, which in tabletop simulator, we can kind of just grab a bunch of stuff, hit G, group them together, uh, unselect the token we accidentally selected, grab the cards, and since we put down the point, the snap point, it immediately snaps into place, give it a good shuffle, and it goes on to say, you pause to drink some water from your canteen. Voluminous, voluminous clouds drift lazily overhead. You see Calypso emerge from the trees and walk down the trail towards you. Let us walk together for a while, she says. I need to share some bits of wisdom with you. It may be some time until our paths cross again out here in the wild. And it says, before you build the rest of your deck, We'll continue playing this time using only your rangers, personality cards, and background cards. So now we're going to do the refresh phase, which, according to the rule book, has several different steps. So we'll close this. Um, it says to draw one ranger card, refill energy pools, and ready cards in play. Uh, we already did do the energy pools, so we'll draw the six cards, one more shuffle. And an additional step must be taken. Because it is a perfect day, we're supposed to discard one cloud from this. So there are three. We'll go ahead and just grab one, put it back in the bag. Now there's two left. So the perfect day has two more uh, rounds until it will disappear. Now we will begin the turn anew. But in order to do that, we've got to continue to point 18. And we'll be told to search the valley set for Calypso. And the valley set is a location set. And in the demo, she's on top. So we'll pull her off and copy her to have a separate existence of her or a separate copy of her to not accidentally delete her or get her lost in uh, the shuffle. And it tells us that we need to commit uh, basically a connection with her reconnect with her, reconnect with our person who trained us to be a ranger in the hopes that we can get her to uh, advance our training and go about our ways as we've completed our training. And the boulder field does have something special that's going to actually affect our turn. It says reduce the presence of all beings in play by one. So as we start our turn, it's telling us to not read or campaign entry, I'll explain that in just a second, because we're going to just follow this scripted interaction instead. And we are going to interact with this card, and as you can see, she's got a an 85 with a book near her presence number, and that means that when you see a card with a number, whether it's a friendly being or not, you read the entry, and it'll kind of tell you more about the background, and it's kind of like the flavor text they don't include, as well as maybe some other alternative rules that could pop up. She can be cleared by injury, which is unfortunate. And if, an, uh, if a friendly being is ever cleared by injury, basically it's the end of the day. She can also be cleared by progress, which she needs three per ranger, in our case, just three. She's friendly, which means she doesn't fatigue us if we commit uh, a test that is beyond uh, where she's at. She's, cl she's got clear instructions, whether damage or with, or injury or with uh, progress. And then she's got challenge card effects, including having a predator attacker, which is a common thing for uh, friendly beings. So now we're ready to start the turn. And at the start of every turn, we pull a card from the path deck. So as you can see, we already have one path card in effect. We have another one, and this is a big one. So this is the Caustic Mulcher. And this one is a pretty uh, interesting being that has a lot of complex moving parts sur uh, surrounding it. And I'm going to hopefully just push beyond it and not have it be too much of a problem. Uh, it can be cleared with either six damage or nine presence, or it can be, or I can uh, as well have some interactions where I'm going to wrestle with it and pull myself away from it. So 
it uh, will also stop me from advancing the game state if I get attached to it. So this will complicate our plans. Um, we're going to, at this point, try to formulate a plan based on what's in our hand. So we have two trail mixes, a strider, um, ironwood to recoup some fatigue if we'd like from playing lots of moments. Well, I think we're going to try to clear Calypsa, so we'll take two spirit and not play the ironwood this turn. Because both Caustic Mulcher and Overgrown Thicket are in the along the way part of the map, I don't have to worry about them for testing in within reach. So we've, for total effort for our test, which if we remind ourselves, we are choosing the test, we're committing the effort, first the energy and then the appropriate icons. We've got a grand total of four to three. We'll go ahead and pull the top card of the challenge deck, and it's a zero. So that means we put uh, the full effort we committed, which was a uh, total of four. We'll go ahead and uh, we'll just use dice for that. I could spin the dice to four. So now we've got four on her. But now we have to go from weather, location, missions on down. So there's no yellow sun effect but there is along the way and if there is another active being exhaust it and attach it to this bio mold and there is another active being so we go ahead and exhaust her and attach her to the bio mold and it says that um, beings attached to the bio mold cannot ready which means that if she needed to be ready for some reason we'd be in trouble so this is an interesting moment where we've connected with our old trainer, the bio, the caustic mulcher, this, this bio meld looks like they've got her. And she is, however, ready for being cleared. And that's where we're at. So we're ready to clear her. And so if I cleared Calypso, which even if she's grabbed by the mulcher, it says that you cannot travel if your ranger token's on there, but doesn't say you can't clear if they're attached. So as I imagine it, the bio, the caustic mulcher has got her, and as she's getting dragged forward, I'm able to connect with her or use some training she maybe taught me to help pull her out. And that's kind of the fiction I see happening. So we'll go ahead and read the card. It says, and that was the last time I went swimming near a latrinal holt. You and Calypso share a laugh. She takes the hem of your cloak between her thumb and forefinger and nods solemnly. You are now a ranger of the valley, she says. You are charged with protecting its people and lending aid to any in need. But while you do, take care to look out for each other. Your fellow rangers will need help, and you will need them. She steps back and smiles. It's time to return to Lone Tree Station. I must go by a different route but I will see you there. And so we'll return her to the valley set, which she, this is a copy, so I'll just go ahead and delete her. And it says, now that you have had an opportunity to try some cards for your background set, it's time to choose your specialty. Your ranger specialty represents the recent past and the occupation to which they've dedicated themselves in the ranger. In other words, what kind of ranger you want to be, where you will take one of the four specialties uh, a set that includes not just the cards, but also two specific kinds of cards that are unusual in that they are cards that start in play and have effects you, you can rely upon at any given moment. And we will uh, then build cards out from there. So we're supposed to grab the specialty cards and choose a total of five specific different cards, so two copies each for a total of ten, and we'll pick a roll call, a roll card that will affect kind of how things, uh, really kind of how our deck can operate on a turn by turn basis. And since we're solo, we don't have to worry about anyone else, what anyone else wants. And then we'll do what we did last time where we will uh, basically go to the refresh stage, draw up our hand size and uh, try to flee this caustic mulcher. 
So recall the, we will recall the backgrounds, which I did not do last time. And now we will place the specialties, which are a much larger set because you include more of, the ba more of a base, plus you have these roll cards. There's artificers who tinker. There's conciliators who are uh, conciliators who are the kind of people who interact with other beings, so they're really good with animals and people. There's explorers who pathfind or uh, seek out. And then there's the kind of wizards or special manipulators, the shapers, who are very advanced class, who kind of play with the, met with the meta of the game or with the mechanics of the game and can do some pretty extreme uh, things with the cards. So with the way I see this character being, I kind of see them being more of an explorer. I'm not sure if they're quite a fearless pathfinder so much as an undaunted seeker, someone who just knows when they're going to head out, they're just going to head out, and they're going to do their best to succeed at every test they try. So then we get to pick five cards and do a total of ten, so two each. And... They include a variety of different cards. I'd like this one in particular. I think this would be a fun one. Um, what else are there? And you'll note that they go up to three in the uh, specific specialty cards. Uh, so I can only take, because I'm a three fitness with this character, I can only take Afforded by Nature. I cannot take Share in the Valley Secrets, Hidden Trail, or Cradled by the Earth. Uh, I think I'll take Walk With Me, this way as I'm using my extremely proficient traverse tests, I'll be able to also clear beings, so that'll be a handy way to take advantage of the way my character's built. I think I'll go ahead and take um, Boundary Sensor. I think I'll go ahead and take, let's see here, yeah, I guess I'll go ahead and take the hiking staff, and I might as well take afforded by nature. Why not take one that'll take all my uh, all my fitness to play? So that gives us the deck. Oh, I guess I'll do it like this. And it says to then um, yeah, set up um, like we said. So I'll go ahead and put away recall. Then I will take the new cards, take my hand, grab them up, and it says continue to the refresh phase. So uh, weather token gone, energy recovered. Give it one more shovel, draw up to six. And now we're going to try to travel. So there still is a start of the round. Note that there is no hard tracker that has a fixed number of turns we have to do. We're instead kind of judging how our progress is by a more flexible and fluid mark for check mark. For figuring out where we're at. So we'll go ahead and draw the top of the path cards, and it is a wolfhound who, thanks to Boulder Field, only has a presence of one. But it does take either four damage or six presence to clear. That's quite the uh, that's quite the difficult level to match. Now, notably, I can dodge a card for a test, which means with this kind of a character playing alone with a high fitness, it might be worth it to make tests either along the way or even uh, in the surroundings, as the locations are, to try to uh, make big plays and rely on daunt Undaunted Seeker's power to kind of minimize the amount of fatigue I'm suffering. And... We can look at what my hand is now and figure out what I want to do. Strider is potentially going to be the key to that because Strider says it, 
that uh, these very valuable three icons can only be contributed to a trail, and it just so happens that Boulder Field is a trail. So at the start of my turn, I'm trying to calculate what my risk and rewards are. Uh, if I can get through the overgrown thicket, then there's a chance I can just plow through the boulder field pretty quickly. But the overgrown thicket has obstacle, which means it has to be cleared first, which means suddenly I've got to ref I've got to kind of think uh, figure that problem out first before I go forward. So I've got kind of two ways I can play my hand. One is use things like trail mix to soothe my uh, fatigue. Or I could, so I could set that up and I could set up boundary sensor and then maybe use compassionate to try to clear off um, the, maybe the Prowling Wolfhound and then take a slower turn because I still have to clear off the overgrown thicket. And the trail mix and the boundary sensor will let me have a better next turn. Uh, and note that as I'm thinking about this, I'm not necessarily thinking about tests I'll take, but also how to set up. Thanks to the overgrown thicket kind of blocking my path and having a lot of red cards I could play in my hand, that's kind of where I'm thinking. So I'll go ahead and pay two energy. So the trail mix comes in play with two morsels. Oops, those are progress tokens. Let's go ahead and grab the all-purpose tokens. And it is a gear card, so it goes in play and stays in play. It's got a number of pips that count against the total number of, uh, of gear you can have in play rather than have like specific body parts that get covered up. Instead, you've got a generic five and things just kind of fit on your body in various ways in ways that you can kind of imagine. And it lets me just uh, recover fatigue equal to my fitness, which is for me next turn going to be a lot of fatigue. Then I'll spend my other one to do boundary sensor, my other fitness to do boundary sensor, set up some boundary sensors so I can uh, make more, to basically have a better understanding of the terrain around me and, in, and therefore plot my movement better. So I've got a total of four out of my five, my kind of uh, gear slots filled up. So I'm gonna go ahead now and commit two spirit and compassionate to make some progress on the Wolfhound and hope I don't <laughs> pull a, uh, a bad card. So I am going to, uh, for my challenge, so I'm going to draw the top card of the challenge deck and it's a plus one, which gives me one, two, three, four, five. And then I'll put five progress counters on the Wolfhound. Note, I didn't need to use my Undaunted Seeker because I, these two cards are along the way not within reach and I'm doing a check against a card within reach so nothing could really basically cause me to have fatigue. And then I have to go and after applying the results have to check the challenge icon which was red. The Caustic Mulcher says add one to each being on here uh, and rangers as well take damage. This is bad if uh, a being you want to save who's friendly is on the Caustic Mulcher they can obviously get slowly digested. The Wolfhound says if I have three or more fatigue, exhaust the being. And note we go from uh, weather to along the way to within reach, and that's the order we do them in. So the Caustic Mulcher would go first and then the Wolfhound. Now I do have two fatigue, so I did luck out and did not take a wound. So the Wolf's nipping at my, he my heels, but I'm a little too quick to get caught. So we uh, can kind of like take a step back and see where we're at now. So I've got one focus to uh, energy and two awareness energy. I think I'm going to risk it and do a focus check, which is to remember my training to scout ranger cards equal to your effort and draw one ranger card. So this puts me at one and that puts me at plus one. So a total of two. So I get to scout two and draw one. I think I'll go ahead and put this in my hand. I don't have any moments, so I'll put the um, 
put that on the bottom. And now I have to finish up with the uh, challenge icons, and this is a red challenge icon, uh, but nothing affects, and I have less than the number of fatigue the required to trigger the attack, so it will misses me again. Now I could use an awareness, I could make an awareness check, but I don't uh, to do an avoid, but I don't think I'm going to bother because I have nothing. I don't really have anything I want to dodge at this point. Note as well, I could do the remember action even though I have within reach cards because the action isn't checking against something that would cause me to uh, have fatigue because it's not. Uh, it doesn't have me engage against or along the paths into beyond within reach or uh, beyond uh, along the way as it would be if I tried to maybe clear the boulder field. So we're going to do our refresh stage. We're going to remove the last all-purpose token here, the weather card, and it flips to sunny day, which completely kind of changes how the weather works. And now the sun icon is going to be harsh and brutal, but I can take a blue focus action to locate shade in order to add more clouds if I've got spare focus. Then I will pull another path card, and then that's a, kind of the worst is another overgrown thicket. So now we're getting a little bit tied down with these obstacles. If it wasn't for these obstacles, I could just kind of run past the caustic, caustic mulcher, but that's not quite going to happen. Oh, one thing I did forget to do was draw a card at the end of the turn because the, uh, the perception had confused me. So now we're ready to begin. I'm going to uh, spend an all-purpose token uh, to do the really cool th thing about this game that the fatigue stack represents, which is kind of an, a liminal space between discarded, out of play, and in your deck, and that is to soothe, which lets you draw up cards. And since I've got three fitness, I'll draw up to three, which is only two, and now I've got more skill cards in my hand, which will hopefully help me complete some difficult skill tests. So now I'm ready to kind of plan out the rest of my turn. I'll go ahead and spend two spirit to try to clear out the prowling wolf hound. And there is nothing between us, so I won't have to suffer fatigue. Okay, so I pulled a zero. And that means that my total effort is two. It has a target number of one because the presence is reduced by one. So my total effort is even if it was two, is still two, but the fact that it's one just made it a little bit easier. So now the five goes up to six plus one for a total of seven total effort. Then I do the red icons, which luckily, usually red is the, the worst one to have, but I luck out so I can clear off the presence, or the progress, excuse me, and the wolf is shooed away. I convince the wolf to go look for prey elsewhere. Now, however, comes the part that's going to challenge me a little bit. So we can use Boundary Sensor to get an extra effort out of Traverse. And we can use Awareness to hunt your way through to add progress equal to the effort. So I think I'm going to go ahead and do Awareness because that will uh, put me, that'll leave a pile of fitness for a second skill test. And the total effort is beginning at two, and then I can use the uh, traverse icons to try to stack up. I'll go ahead and use this card, the perceptive. So I'm going to perceptively perceive my way through uh, to hunt for a way through. Very fitting. And then I pull the top card of the challenge deck, and I get a zero. And that lets me put on three... And then since I succeeded, I'll get one back awareness. And then I'm looking for blue icons. And it says, discard one from this feature. It fatigues you. That means I can, in fact, discard one from this feature. It will, dis it will fatigue me. And no other blue challenge icons. So when that's done, we'll go ahead and resolve the progress. Now this leaves me with an interesting decision point. I could spend that awareness I'd gotten back, and the bold, even though it's a red card, it's the matching icons that matter, so I could spend it for the 
hunt test, that is awareness plus the uh, icons, the uh, traverse icons, which would let me have a chance at succeeding. The, this is where there is kind of a, a risk reward that you do when you test. So the challenge deck has a range of minus two to plus one. So if you want to guarantee success, you must go up by two. And if you're up by one, then you do have a chance to fail, although there aren't that many minus twos. So I think I'm gonna risk it because I really want to get out of this location. And because it's green again, I lucked out and I will go ahead and put a total of three on it. But I am of course gonna get fatigued again, uh, thanks to the challenge icon of blue. So discard one from it, but I <clears throat> over succeeded because it takes two per ranger and there's only one of me, so it just takes two. And that brings the three down to two. So uh, everything worked out and I succeeded, I lucked out. I get to clear that. Now we have an interesting potential escape route. So this is where I'm gonna really put some effort in. So I'm going to initiate a fitness test. I'm gonna kind of go all out. I'm gonna spend one of my all-purpose tokens from boundary sensor, which is a sensor token, and it will exhaust, which means we turn it sideways. Then I will, uh, so that gives me four. Then I will commit Strider because Boulder Field is a trail. And this gives me three more icons for a total of six. And I will use my Undaunted Seeker to dodge a card, which means we exhaust my card. And this three, which became two, does not fatigue me. And then I'm guaranteed to success because there's no auto fails. Uh, and it's, indeed, I pulled a minus one. And I'm then going to check the challenge icons once I'm done putting on the six progress. And there are no blue icons in play, so I do not suffer any challenge effects. It whiffs, and I'm done. Now I can, if I would like to, spend this last focus icon and see what happens, but the yellow icon will hurt me, so I'm not going to risk it. This is where sometimes you got to kind of decide if something's worth it or not and I'm not going to, so then we'll do the end of turn uh, refresh. Technically, there is a rest action that you take, but it doesn't really matter in solo player. In solo play and multiplayer, it will matter. So if you're not doing anything for a round, you rest, and then uh, you carry on. So in solo, you just act like, uh, you just can treat it like the end of your turn. So now we're going to clean up our energy, draw our, draw our card, uh, and uh, travel, although technically I guess I should have traveled before I drew my card. Sorry about that. Put that back. So now we're going to uh, travel to Lone Tree Station. You emerge from the line of trees and find yourself walking through a vast rolling field. In the distance, you see the towering form of Lone Tree Station rising against the clear sky, and on the breeze you smell a hint of something sweet. Is someone baking? And the prologue is nearly complete. So we'll go ahead and do the, traver the, the travel action. So we've got enough uh, progress to travel. And if we check the uh, turn order, this is where I kind of got ahead a little bit, I'm gonna rewind time this a little bit. The phases go ranger phase to travel phase, to refresh phase. So if we do the travel phase, we clear the play area and persistence are the ones who follow us. This one is not persistent, so it goes in the discard pile. Um, even if it's along the way, it doesn't follow you unless it's persistent and only a few beings are persistent. So we lucked out there. Uh, then we will travel to the new location. So we're going to one tree station. So again, we're gonna follow the woods. Then we can decide to camp or not, which we won't. That's how you end a game. And then we get to build the path deck, which we will begin doing in just a second. And we pull up the Lone Tree Station uh, card, which has the arrival instructions. So we'll pull up the instructions, and it says well, we should clear up the play area, gather your deck, discard pile, fatigue stack, and hand into your ranger deck, 
and hand uh, shuffle them all into your ranger deck and set it aside. So we'll go ahead and do that. It did say fatigue this time. Uh, grab this. We don't need this dice anymore. We don't need these all purpose tokens. Then we'll grab the trail mix. And our deck has 28 out of the 30 cards it's supposed to have. And then we are going to choose my outside interest for the character. And it should be from the starting pool, but not an advanced card. And uh, it basically can be any card that isn't uh, in someone else's deck or advanced. And there is a list on page 33 of the rulebook if you would like some guidance. So that means, you know, just look whatever card you want, whatever you think works for you, whether it's a personality card, a specialty card, or a background card. And I think I saw a card that I thought would be kind of fun. And let's see here. I think I want a moment because I do have kind of a moment thing going on. But yeah, if you have two spirit, you can go take Oru the Sheepdog. I imagine Oru is going on a lot of adventures with a lot of different rangers, because who doesn't love a good puppy to follow you around? Um, I think the one that was... let's see here. I thought I wanted something to help me clear beings. But um, let's see here. Hmm. Check out the background cards more. Hmm. I don't know. So my ranger is adventurous outdoors type who's kind of on their own exploring the what uh, yeah, let's just healing touch. Yeah, maybe there are better cards if I was being a bit more deliberate, but yeah, it's kind of drawn to a spirit event. Kind of round out my ranger. And now we've chosen the uh, basically the 15th or 30th card if you double it. It says that now we can uh, begin the, now that we're ready to begin, we're gonna start with entry one under missions. And it starts with page one. But why don't we stop here? It's a good stopping spot for our efforts. Well, thank you very much for going on this journey with me, Rangers. Next time we play, we'll uh, clean up the board a little bit more and start to play one day of our deck having built our adventurous explorer who's going to explore the valley and find out a bit more about the uh, fun things you can do on this uh, excellent demo provided by earthborn games and see you next time